so uh, so let's get started. Um, so my name's uh, James Burkhart from um, from Dork, and um, on, behalf, on behalf of all the team at Dork, it's um, my pleasure to welcome all of you to this evening's uh, webinar session, which is on the topic of uh, buckling techniques. And um, we're really pleased to be able to uh, have three speakers talking on the topic this evening, who I'll, I'll introduce in a second. I just want to go through the, the housekeeping one more time for anyone who's just uh, joining the session now. Um, anyone attending is, is uh, joining automatically on mute and with your video disabled. So please either use the, the chat box, which we'll be monitoring for any questions or equally technical issues. And, uh, and you also have the option to raise hand, in which case we can, um, we can uh, come around and take you off mute and you can, you can make your question um, via the audio, which is also an option. And just to reiterate, please uh, do fill in the evaluation form that you'll receive after this event, um, and uh, we'll be able to um, formalize the, the CPD point, which is available through attendance. So um, without further ado, I'd uh, like to introduce and hand over to uh, uh, the three speakers. We have um, Steve Charles from Manchester, Richard Haynes from Bristol, and Aman Chandra from Southend. And uh, I'd like to thank them on behalf of Dort for taking the time out to uh, uh, to run this session and without further ado hand over to to steve who's going to uh, to moderate the session so i'll just uh stop sharing there and uh, you should be able to share steve so over to you thank you very much so let's get my presentation up okay great can everyone see the screen for feedback there not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Ah, yeah, there we go. Uh, there, there we, we go. go. Going. Super, is that? Can you see that? Come on. Yeah. Yep. Can see great. It now. yeah. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for attending. So, uh, this is just to confirm we're going to be discussing rectal attachment treatment and bucking techniques and we have three speakers myself richard haynes and Amal chandra and so the audience this is aimed at is basically trainees so uh vitretal fellows uh, vit, uh, retinal trainees um, i think that's the majority of the audience there are some consultants in the audience as well which is lovely welcome uh there's people signed in from mainly from the UK but actually around the world so uh, welcome to everyone. So what we're going to do is basically go through retinal detachment repair and how you might fix it but with a particular emphasis on scleral buckling surgery. And so to begin with we have to make our minds up how are we going to fix this retinal detachment? Are we going to do a vitrectomy which is clearly the commonest technique or might we use scleral buckling? And for this we're going to be talking about the pre-opt examination so we decide which technique to use. And then we'll be going through how to do the surgery and we'll do it in a sort of stepwise way, okay? So um, if you do think of questions then, so do use the chat box. There will be opportunities to ask questions at various times, probably at the end of my little talk, which will be about 10, 15 minutes, and then after Richard and then after Aman, and then we'll have some cases at the end. Okay, so broadly speaking, if you have eyes that don't have a vitreous detachment, really this is probably, scleral buckling should be the default procedure for that. And so we are thinking about patients that have a rattle dialysis, where the vitreous would be attached, or the sort of younger myopic patients that have a vitreous attached, but with detachment related to small atrophic breaks. So these would be your pretty standard default patients for consideration of scleral buckling. Now I'd like to do a little poll now. So um, we're going to be asking, oh, well done, James, brilliant. You should be able to click here. So how often do you use the indirect top thermoscope? So the Hattie indirect top thermoscope in your clinic, clinical practice. Do you use it always in every clinic? Do you use it once a week, once a month, less often or never? So let's all be honest about this. So um, I'm gonna fill it as well. So I think if we, if you basically click on that and then submit, so click on your answer and then submit. And I think hopefully, uh, James is sure we're going to see some answers. 
Yep, you will indeed. I'm just waiting for the votes to come in. We've got 39 of, oh, 41 of 52 people voted. So I'll just keep it open for a couple of seconds longer. Just be honest, people. Please be honest. You want an honest assessment of use of the indirect ophthalmoscope app. Okay, that, that poll's okay, been that open looks... for, for a minute now. We've got 42 that people, fine. and that's we'll fine. There we go. So um, I'll end that and then share results. So you should be able to see the results there. Oh, that's actually pretty impressive. I, <laughs> that's very good. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, anyway, that's, that's very good. Um, I've, clearly, there is a concern that actually the use of the indirect ophthalmoscope is going down in popularity, but that's, that's quite reassuring. So in the preoptive examination, you need to do a slit lamp examination. We need to find out whether the vitreous is attached or detached. And you can see uh, in the slide here behind the lens, the crinkled surface as opposed to a hyaluronic face. We need to make an assessment of whether there's pigment in the vitreous gel or not. And of course we're using fundoscopy. Now, many trainees in the UK probably quite understandably because of the wonderful uh, indirect viewing le handheld lenses we have, may not use the indirect ophthalmoscope regularly in clinic. I think it has to be said. So one is slightly worried about uh, la la loss of skill over time. So it is terribly important to practice indirect ophthalmoscopy. And it's a really a skill to develop in the, the rational clinics that you're in. And you see here, to one of our fellows with a nice solid stand, stance, side on, you should be feeling comfortable so you're not getting any, any backache at all. And then you should be practicing scleral indentation. And with this, you should put some drops of that anesthetic drop on the eye. You should use a cotton bud or an indenter over the eyelid. I used to have a little metal indenter in my pocket for years and years and years, but actually it's not very hygienic and a cotton bud is more comfortable for the patient and it's you know, sterile or very clean and, and, and throw away when you've, when you've used it. So I'd recommend a cotton bud. Use a couch or a reclining chair to get the, lie the patient down. And you just need to practice scleral indentation because it does enable dynamic indentation where you can assess the uh, depth of subretinal fluid. And the key thing is practice, practice, practice. And so for the trainees in the audience, at any opportunity, do practice indirect, indirect ophthalmoscopy and your scleral indentation. Because basically you don't want to be doing it in the operating room. So in the pre examination, you need to be working out where are the breaks, where's the retinal detachment. And back in the day, so when I was a trainee, it was expected to produce color diagrams and we had different crayons for what was detached, what was attached, what was lattice, where the breaks were. That, that's actually a very useful way of learning where everything is. These days, of course, everyone is spoiled because we have these wonderful uh, wide field optos photographs. And you can see in this picture here, some atrophic retinal breaks. So, Actually, in the modern day, in electronic patient records, um, optos photographs you know, are really uh, important to document the, the situation. But for the trainees, do really try and work out what's going on with examination and make a, make a diagram. So having, found, having examined the patient, you need to think, have I found all the breaks? And do the signs that I see fit in with the distribution of the subrattal fluid? And really make sure that all of you are aware of Linkoff's law and if you haven't read the paper do it's one of the most important papers in in rattle detachment surgery it's very old so 1971 so Harvey Linkoff looked at a thousand cases and basically looked at the distribution of the fluid and where the tears were and so broadly speaking if you have a, a super nasal or temporal attachment with predominant fluid on one side well the break is going to lie within one and a half clock hours of the highest border of the detachment in the majority of the cases. So if you see here, you've got most of the fluid up here. You sort of know that the break is going to be up in this area. And then here we have inferior retinal attachment. We can see that the fluid goes higher on one side than the other. And actually the higher border of the fluid will indicate the side of the break the vast majority of the time. And with a total or superior attachment, if the fluid crosses the midline uh, above and courses down both sides, and actually most of the time the break will be in a triangle whose apex is 12 and whose sides extend to 10.30 and 1.30. So when examining somebody, just think, 
does the fluid fit in with the breaks that I see? Now, Richard will be talking about um, what sort of um, buckles he used. My default buck explants for still buckling surgery, if it's superior, would tend to be a circumferential 277 buckle, uh, which is seen here, which has got a sort of a con uh, cave profile. Uh, with inferior breaks, I tend to use a slightly more sort of chunky 287, which has a, um, a more, well, has a, a convex profile. For dialysis, I tend to use a three millimeter sponge. And if you had a, a radial tear in between muscles, again, I'd consider a, a radial sponge. So if you have an elevated U tear, uh, what will we use, use for this? Well, you could consider a radial sponge. That'd be a good case for a radial sponge. And if here we have an Optos photograph, we can see circumferential pathology. We've got some holes here and here and here. And if you've got circumferential pathology, then you're going to be thinking about a circumferential explant. So here we have a, an explant going and covering all the breaks. If you have a pseudophagic eye with a total retal attachment where no retal breaks are visible, then actually rather than still buckling surgery, you're going to be thinking of doing a vitrectomy. It gives you a much better view. If you have multiple U tears, well, you could put multiple small buckles on. That would take quite a lot of time. You could put a very large expansive buckle or you could do a vitrectomy. If you have multiple tears close together, well, again, you could use a segmental circumferential buckle here. Here we have a patient that has an inferior dialysis. You can see it down here with a little sort of allied small split there. And so this would be a perfect case for a circumferential explant as seen here. And many people use a sponge. Some people use a, a, a normal sort of buckling explant. If you have a highly elevated break, then localization can be difficult. And back in the day, we probably used something called a deace technique, where you drain subretal fluid, put air in, did cryotherapy when the retina was attached again, and did an explant. But overall, these days, I think the vitrectomy is best. So we've done our pre-op examination. We've decided we're going to do buckling surgery. So what do we do next? Peritomy. Now, we need to position the patient well, so the eye is facing upwards. And the peritomy, you might think, well, that's the easy bit, isn't it? You just cut through the conjunctiva. That's, I, can, I can relax then, can't I? Well, no, do take time in dissecting the conjunctiva, because here we have a case that's had poor conjunctival closure, sort of a ridge there. And all the pa although the patient may have 65 vision unaided, and we think they're very clever, this patient will get dry eye for the rest of their life, so and need regular lubricants. So be very careful with conjunctival opening and closure. And clearly the worst case scenario is you get an explosive ex explant. So opening the um, conjunctiva, basically you want to try and get it so that the tenons and conjunctiva come together. Remember the tenons inserts about a millimetre uh, behind the limbus. And so by cutting through the, the conjunctiva together with the subtenons, you put one blade of the scissors underneath the tenons and then sweep forwards and then you'll get both layers together. And so here we've cut through our conjunctival and tenons and are reflecting that back. So should you do 360 peritomy and sling all four muscles, or should you do a limited peritomy? Well, I think, let's just go up again. I think when you're starting off doing still buckling surgery, it's, it's probably easier to sling all four muscles. It does make cryotherapy easier. But actually, if you can, if you know you're going to do a, a localised buckle, do try, try and preserve as much conjunctiva as possible. In slinging the muscles, remember that when you're slinging the lateral rectus, you're going to be going above. Oops, sorry, not again. Um, so you don't catch inferior oblique. And then again, with superior rectus, you're going to be going temporally, so you don't catch um, the super oblique muscle. Using bridal suture, then this we use, tend to use a black silk suture, which is reverse mounted. So here we can see that the um, uh, the needle, the blunt end is going underneath the muscle. And then with your own position, operate over the patient. So you'll have a temporal position when you're operating nasally and vice versa. And then when you slung your muscles, inspect the sclera. 
And this is actually very important because you may see areas of scleral thinning. This is actually a case that uh, was, I did many years ago. The patient was sui pseudophagic actually, but it's only when we reflected uh, the, the conjunctiva and put the bridal sutures in, we realized that this patient actually, prior to their cataract surgery, been extremely myopic, and clearly you don't want to be doing buckling surgery with this thing of sclera. So now we're ready to examine the eye to confirm brattle breaks. And I'd like to hand over now to Richard Haynes, who's going to continue the surgery. Over to you, Richard. Okay, so um, Steve, if you uh, turn off your screen sharing. Which I think I have actually. Okay, and. Hold on a second, there we go. So thanks very much, Steve. Um, now, um, actually that's gone onto the full screen version, hold on. There we go. Okay, thanks Steve. So um, as uh, Steve has just said, once you've done your pre-op assessment and you've prepped the eye by slinging the muscles, the next thing you want to do is mark the scleral uh, um, position of the retinal breaks. And you do that by using an indirect ophthalmoscope and a 20 diopter lens and indenting underneath where the breaks are. That produces a little mark on the sclera, which you can then mark with a pen. And you can also do that with a curved artery clip. A curved artery clip is really nice because it allows you to sort of slide around until you're right underneath the break and then press firmly and that will leave a little mark. Obviously be very careful if you've got thin sclera, as Steve has just said. You can also use this thing called a gas indenter which has got a little uh, ring on the end and that leaves a nice ring shape uh, that's easy to see but it doesn't slide around quite as easily as the curved artery clip. Uh, so once you've made your mark on the sclera, dry it with a cotton tip and then mark it with a pen and then dry it again and then grasp that mark that you've made with a pair of St. Martin's forceps and then look again with the indirect and indenting with those St. Martin's forceps to ensure that you've got exactly the correct position of the break. You also need to be aware of parallax error. So you can see the line of sight is coming in here and it looks like point A is underneath the break, and particularly if you're not indenting very firmly or uh, very much, but actually you can see when the break is in its actual position, it's actually at point B. So that's something to be aware of. Now, um, if the back edge of the break is posterior to the buckle, as you can see here, this will lead to failure. So uh, you need to make sure that you've got a buckle that's large enough so that the brakes are fully supported and the back edge of the buckle is uh, behind the most posterior edge of the brake. And the way you do that is you measure. So you've made your little mark and you need to measure this distance from the back edge of the brake up to the muscle insertion where the aura serrata is. And then you'll choose a buckle that's wide enough to um, pass from behind the back edge of the brake, which is here, uh, right the way up to the aura serrata. Now, David McLeod in the 80s, he talked about the break aura occlusive buckle. And what he means by that is from the break all the way up to the aura, that whole area is occluded by the buckle. And if you don't do that, what can happen is subretinal fluid can leak anterior to your buckle, even though the back edge is nicely covered, it can leak anteriorly. So what you want is uh, like this really, you want the whole of the um, area between the back edge of the buckle and the aura occluded to stop that happening. Now when it comes to cryotherapy, you need to indent firmly underneath where the breaks are and uh, wait for the ice ball to uh, freeze and uh, freeze the overlying retina. And then when it thaws, wait for it to thaw completely. Don't pull away too quickly or you can crack the blood vessels in the choroid and cause a choroidal hemorrhage. And you want to avoid repeated cryo in the same spot. They can overlap slightly, but don't repeatedly cryo in the same position because that will cause cryonecrosis and the retina will just fall apart there and uh, that will cause the surgery to fail. 
Now the end point uh, of cryotherapy in the presence of subretinal fluid. So when there's a lot of subretinal fluid, you can see on the little diagram here, there's a lot of subretinal fluid. The breaks are up here in the detached retina. The ice ball is quite small and you can just see the ice ball developing there. But then you wait until the ice ball is large enough so that it's reached the retina and then it will highlight the retinal breaks. You can see the holes there. You have to wait until uh, the retina is frozen as well uh, and then let it thaw. If you don't freeze the overlying retina, you won't get adhesion forming. And when you're doing your cryotherapy, it's quite often what happens is the probe will slide backwards like this and you, you can't keep the eye still and the, and the cryo ends up in the wrong place. So you can get around that by holding on uh, to the eye with the bridal sutures uh, and stabilizing the eye and then you can get the cryo in the right place. You've got to be very careful not to inadvertently cryo posterior to where you think you are. It's quite easy to do this. If you're looking in through this axis here and you can see there's an indentation here and you think that's the tip of your cryo, but actually the tip is down here on the macula, uh, cryo in the macula. So you want to be really certain you've got the tip of the cryo probe. And a good way to do that is to uh, angle it against the sclera and then bounce it up and down a little bit so that you're, you've convinced yourself that's the tip. And then look posterior behind it to make sure there's nothing else there and then put your cryo on. And I, I tend to like controlling the cryo myself so somebody isn't, else isn't pressing the pedal uh, and um, thinking of something else. Uh, now the, the sutures that you need, you want a spatulated needle which means it's flat on the end like this, non-absorbable suture because you want that suture to last forever, you don't want uh, the buckle to come loose. Uh, it needs to be uh, ideally something like fibroethabond and a quarter circle needle uh, is ideal because that allows you to pass horizontally through the layers of the sclera. Uh, the suture is also side cutting. Now um, ideally you need to operate over the cornea and um, loops are very good for this so that you can uh, see uh, the depth at which you're passing the needle through or use the operating microscope which is ideal really because you can really magnify in. That can limit your posterior view a little bit but uh, once you get used to it, operating with a microscope is, is the way to go because you'll be able to do that uh, um, all your career. Remember that the needle side cutting, so the flatness of the needle needs to be against the flatness of the sclera like this, not at right angles to it because that side cutting will cut down into the corrid and cause bleeding. Now when you're passing your sutures, the first movement is to push the needle down so you create a little depression and then you move sideways so the tip of the needle goes into the layers of the sclera and then you rotate your wrist so that the suture passes through the sclera and then comes out. Just be careful with the heel of the needle as it comes out because that's quite sharp and that can cause damage internally as well uh, if you sort of back, back it backwards into the choroid. So uh, this video here so you press down and then move the needle horizontally. Don't lose sight of the tip of the needle. Try and keep watching it all the time. If you lose sight of the tip of the needle, you might be too deep. Just going to show you that in higher power. So pressing down and then start moving horizontally through the layers of the sclera, making sure you can see where the tip is as it's passing through and then comes out. Now the bite separation, and what I mean by that is, is the separation between the posterior pass of the suture and then the anterior passes of the suture here. That needs to be the width of the buckle plus two millimetres. So that's one millimetre on one side and one millimetre on the other. And the effect that that has is when it's tightened, it pulls the buckle down and it wraps the sclera around the edges of the buckle, which is what you want, and that creates the indent. So this is it uh, in cross section. You can see that's the diameter of the buckle, seven millimeters in this case, and then the suture overlying it, the bite separation, that's the suture, the blue thing there, and that bite separation is nine millimeters. And when that's tightened, that wraps the sclera around the buckle, creating the internal indent. Now we use this hemi-halstead mattress suture for circumferential buckles, which means the needle goes in here, this is the posterior circumferential pass through the sclera and then the anterior passes uh, go from posterior to anterior towards the cornea and then the second pass comes back the other way 
and likewise the exit point of the needle here needs to be the same uh, buckle width plus two millimeters so that it's the same on both sides. So why do we do this hemi-halsted thing with this anterior suturing here? Well, it's because of the circumferential orientation of the collagen fibers that allows you to have a really nice, uh, strong grip there anteriorly when it's passing radially like that. If it was horizontal, it might cut through because of the um, radial orientation uh, and the circumferential orientation of the fibers. That gives you a, a firm ad uh, adhesion point there. So once you've got your pre-placed sutures in position, you can uh, put your buckle in place, tuck it underneath the muscles to keep it out of the way, and then you tighten your suture with a couple of throws, hold it close to the knot, and then your assistant can hold the knot for you and press down until you can put your locking suture on in the opposite direction. And they hold onto it until you say, let go, and then they let go and you tighten. Now, as Steve has just said, um, round hole detachments, particularly circumferentially orientated, do very nicely with a circumferential buckle, <clears throat> particularly if there's no PVD. And the reason for that is the retina gets sandwiched between the vitreous and the buckle on the outside and the vitreous on the inside, and the vitreous effectively plugs the hole um, when there's no PVD. And in this case, the vitreous is our friend uh, when there's uh, no PVD. So you can use model eyes to practice this, and you can see here measuring with the measuring caliper, the posterior suture position, and then that's the posterior circumferential pass of the needle, and then the anterior pass comes towards the cornea, and then the second away from the cornea, and that's your hemi halstead and then the buckle, buckles trimmed to size and slid underneath the pre-placed sutures and tightened with your assistant holding the knot. And then the buckle can be trimmed so that it's nicely away from the muscles. Now what you want to see, you can see that there's a little ridge anterior to the buckle and that tells you that you've got a nice indent internally because that's telling you that the sclera is wrapped around the edges of the buckle. Now a single um, U-tear, particularly if it's inferior, does very nicely with a, a nice high radial sponge buckle. Now for a sponge buckle, you want the uh, bite spacing to be one and a half times the diameter of the sponge. So if it's a five millimeter sponge, that's a seven and a half millimeter separation. And uh, the radial uh, sponge mattress sutures pass radially from anterior to posterior or vice versa. And in this case, we're putting two sutures on and this is the radial pass through the sclera here, here and here. And this is the bite separation that needs to be 1.5 times the diameter of the sponge. When you come to tying the knots, tie it in a nice square box like that rather than crossing over because you get a better internal configuration and also having nice parallel passes through the sclera with your radial passes uh, makes uh, a nice even distribution rather than like that. Now this um, is a whole video sequence showing a radial sponge being put on, so the conjunctiva being reflected uh, along with the tenons, Fison's retractor goes in, squint hooks, um, a 2-0 or 4 suture reverse mounted to sling the muscles. Then you mark the brakes with your artery clip indenting and once you're certain that you're underneath the brake, mark it with a pen, hold it with some St. Martin's forceps and indent to check the position. Then you get your sponge buckle, you lay it over where you want it to go to make sure it's the right size and then you mark with a caliper one and a half times the diameter of the sponge and that's the orientation you're going to want your sutures. 5-0 Ethabon sutures, double-ended needle and uh, your first needle pass goes from anterior to posterior and it's easier if you use a double-ended suture, so a needle on each side of the suture uh, and you can go from anterior to posterior which is much easier than trying to come from posterior to anterior. That allows you to have a little loop like this and then you can put your sponge in there and tighten the knot over it. 
do a paracentesis to soften the eye. And then that allows you to have a nice high internal indent. Also draining subretinal fluid allows you to get a nice high indent as well. But uh, if you don't want to drain at this point, uh, you can just do the paracentesis, tighten it, have your assistant hold the knot. Hold the uh, suture close to the knot when you're tightening, and that allows you to get a really strong uh, knot. And then for the anterior suture up by the aura serrata and the muscle insertions, that needs to be in line with the posterior suture, parallel to the sponge again, going from anterior to posterior again, and then once again tightening. holding it close to the knot again, and then trim off any proud edges at the front and the back. And it should be nice and smooth like this. This shouldn't be sticking up proud. Uh, the elevation should be internal, not external. So as Steve has said, a dialysis um, often bows backwards uh, in a cord shape uh, configuration. So um, you, a high anterior indent from a sponge is very good for this. And uh, note where the two ends of the dialysis are. And the first step of this is to mark where the two ends of the dialysis are by uh, marking with a, a marker pen with your indentation at either end of the dialysis. And this is the size of the dialysis. Uh, I use a half circle sponge like this and um, measure one and a half times again the, the diameter of the sponge. I do a hemi halstead again for um, a circumferential sponge like this. One posterior and then two anterior passes. These radial passes are in line with the center of the cornea and then the same again. So sutures at either end of the dialysis and then you can pass a pair of forceps underneath and pull the sponge through rather than pushing. It's easier always to pull it through. Do a paracentesis again to soften the eye and then tighten the suture. Hold the knot. Hold it close to the knot to tighten it and let go. So when you've got both sutures tightened, if you get a pair of artery clips and hold either ends of the sponge and then stretch it like that, that makes the sponge conform to the cord shape of the dialysis internally. And then you put a suture across the middle there to keep that cord configuration so that the edge of the dialysis matches really nicely with the shape of the sponge. And then once you've cut your sutures, remove any proud elevated corners like that so that the buckle uh, is nice and uh, smooth and not elevated. And then close the tenons separately so that the uh, sponge is completely covered with the tenons and then close the conjunctiva over the top. That reduces the chance of erosion. Uh, now, a subretinal fluid drainage, the indications for that, if the retinal detachment is too bullous to put the cryotherapy on, you can <coughs> uh, drain subretinal fluid before you put the cryo. Uh, also, if the IOP is high after you put the buckle on, particularly if you're concerned that the central artery is not patent, and also uh, to so that the brakes are flat on the buckle at the end of the case, that uh, probably improves the chance of the uh, buckle working if the brakes are flat on the buckle. Uh, and draining subretinal fluid can help that. You need to choose your drainage site where the subretinal fluid is nice and deep, and you can determine that by indenting with a curved artery clip. Uh, move around until you're certain you're under nice deep subretinal fluid and mark that point. And uh, ideally, you want to avoid draining anywhere near the ampulla of the vortex veins. These tend to be close to the superior and inferior rectus muscles. Uh, so it's therefore safer to drain near the horizontal recti because th there tends not to be uh, vortex vein ampullas in those regions. There's several ways of draining subretinal fluid. You can do it under direct observation with a needle on a syringe with the plunger already removed and you look with an indirect ophthalmoscope, pass your needle in. This diagram is showing it's coming anteriorly 
and I tend to do it behind the buckle and um, you pass the needle towards yourself um, from the opposite side of the cornea and when you're looking with the indirect with your lens you'll see the needle appear underneath the retina going away from yourself it's quite a strange thing uh, a little bit of pressure on the eye from an assistant will then allow the subretinal fluid to drain and as the retina then comes down you pull your needle out another way of doing it is the suture or prang drain this is quite a simple technique hold with a pair of st martin's forceps somewhere secure like the muscle and then pass your needle in sharply ideally you want about a third of the needle sticking out from your castro needle holder and then one movement in perpendicular and then back out again, but then press firmly with your uh, St. Martin's forceps on the eye. That makes the subretinal fluid come out, uh, but you want to press for a good three minutes to um, stop there being a drainage. You've just stuck a needle through the most vascular tissue in the body and it will bleed unless you apply tamponade to it and press on it. You can also be looking by pressing on the eye with your finger at the same time and uh, you can be looking at the drainage site to see uh, if it starts bleeding when you're releasing the pressure after the three minutes. And if it is bleeding, press, carry on pressing. Uh, and then the final technique is to do a cut down. This is really useful if you've got very viscous subrenal fluid in chronic detachments. You can cut down with a blade until you get down to the uh, brown uh, of the choroid. Uh, you then need to diathermy that and prick it with a needle and the subrenal fluid will drain. This doesn't need a lot of pressure on it. And in fact, if you press too hard, the retina might come out uh, and incarcerate. Uh, another technique is to cut down and then use a laser probe held uh, close to the choroid. Everybody puts goggles on and then you fire the laser, pop, 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 and out comes the subretinal fluid. Of course, you can get um, hemorrhage from uh, draining subretinal fluid. You can see this is the drainage site here and hemorrhage uh, progressed towards the macula. If it's a relatively small hemorrhage, it usually doesn't cause much of a problem, particularly if you've got a good buckle. Um, you've got to be careful though if the macula is already detached because blood can track down to the macula and cause um, reduced vision. This is how to do a, a paracentesis safely to lower the pressure. If you come in sort of tangentially over the iris rather than going towards the lens. Uh, also using uh, a diamond knife uh, with an operating microscope uh, is a good way of doing that. And you can continue to press on the back edge of the paracentesis throughout the operation to progressively reduce the pressure. Sometimes you have to inject air in the eye, particularly if you put your buckle on and you can see that the break is fish mouthing. Uh, so a small bubble of air inside will flatten the retina against uh, the buckle. So put your indirect on, but you don't need a lens. Sit temporal and inject nasally. And you want your injection site to be four millimeters back, uh, but uh, you want to make it the highest point of the eye. And then the bubble will progress down from the needle uh, and hopefully you'll get a single bubble unlike in that example there and then hold the injection site as you pull the needle out now at the end of your case you want to have a look at your retina so if you wet a cotton bud and then roll it over the cornea like that that will clear a cornea that you can't see through for about 20 seconds and then that allows you to check the central retinal artery make sure it's patent or pulsating like this really important to do that and also check that the brakes are fully supported on the buckle. You can just see here and here. Now that's a lot of information. It's all in this book by Paul Sullivan. I highly recommend this to you. Go forth and buckle. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. There is a question on the chat line, which has just disappeared from me now. Uh, basically about, was it, was it, uh, a um, what laser settings do you use uh, if you're doing your uh, cut down and laser drain? That's from David. Uh, yeah, it, uh, th that's that. I, I would just put you want a short laser burn for about 0.2 of a second and have it on um, something like 100 milliwatts, something like that. It doesn't need to be a strong because it's a, it's a pigmented thing. And um, if you put it on repeat mode, it will repeatedly fire and eventually burst through the choroid. It usually does that within within a, a few seconds. 
to be honest, I've only ever done that about three times in my entire career because most of the time you can do it with a needle drain or uh, the Charles technique. It's, it's, I've only found it helpful really if it's a you know, really viscous subretinal fluid. It's not something you do very often. Great, so thanks very much, Richard. So I think, uh, Aman, would you like to take the, take the screen, please? Oh, let, me, let me unshare, hold on. Um, yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see my screen there? Yes, yeah. super. Um, thanks to Dork for organizing this. Um, Stephen's kindly given me the title of advanced buckles, um, which suggests I'm advanced at this, at this procedures, um, but I'm, I don't think I am, but I'm, happy to talk about some of the things I'm going to talk about. So they include um, vitrectomy buckle, vitrectomy with encirclement, and talk briefly about encirclement as a process in its own right. Something about chandelier buckles and then suprachoroidal buckles. Um, if we start with these two, I think there's a... Um, so using a buckle as a supplement to a vitrectomy um, or an encirclement and a supplement to a vitrectomy, it's often used in the context of PVR, particularly anterior PVR, or inferior breaks. Now there's, there's lots of arguments um, in favor of, of supplementing the tractomy with a buckle, um, multiple arguments against it, particularly from the UK um, or, and, and some from Egypt. And other papers have shown, again, from the, potentially from the UK and other countries, that actually with inferior breaks, buckles, a supplementary buckle can help. It's um, therefore culturally sensitive subject, but it's a it's a it's a debatable subject. Um, so if I talk about Vichy buckles, I think there was a uh, no, I'll talk about a second. So if I'm adding it, so you can you can add a supplementary segmental buckle such as a two seven seven for an inferior tear or a sponge um, located exactly at the at the area of the break. So if add if doing it with a vitrectomy. Um, do the vitrectomy first, then mark the breaks internally and externally. Place the sutures, I'd recommend doing that in the, in the fluid filled eye because the eye is firmer and you can ensure the pressure is high um, because you've got an infusion line in, with saline going in. And flatten the retina, uh, treat the breaks, place your buckle and then put your tamponade of choice in. So here's a vitrectomy where you can see an inferior detachment there with an inferior, small inferior break there that's got the red circle around it. Um, so the break is marked internally, and then the oh, the conjunctiva is opened, um, and the infrarectus is slung, and then indenting from the outside. Um, I think with a, in this circle, the artery forceps and a marker pen allows you to mark where the break is. The sutures are placed in that semi, in the hemihalstead or semihalstead suture configuration that uh, Richard talked about. And this is um, the fluid filled eye. Then the retina is flattened in this circumstance with a retinotomy and air going into the eye. The inferior break is then treated in the circumstance with cryopexy. You can see that um, inferiorly there. In this circumstance, a 277 buckle was placed and tied. And there you can see that the, um, the inferior break is supported on that external buckle. Um, that can be done, as, as mentioned, with a, if need be, with a, with a small radial sponge as well. Um, so that's supplementing a vitrectomy with a, with a segmental buckle. Vitrectomy encirclement, I think this is the opportunity to do a poll, I think, James. Um, how often do people use an encircling band? I'd be interested to know. Um, certainly, um, I'm a bit younger than the other panelists, but I don't use it very often, and I don't think the other two have used them in the recent past. But I'm interested to know what people, what their experience of using the circling band is. Great. Well, let that run. We've got a, we've got around 35 votes in so far. So um, let's wait a couple of wait another 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, up to 45 responses now. Stephen. Um, uh, Richard, do you, have you used an encircling band at all? Yeah, I, 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 I occasionally use a circling band uh, if I can't find a retinal break, particularly in a pseudophagic eye, because sometimes the breaks can be absolutely uh, tiny uh, yeah. and, and uh, very anterior, and uh, putting in circling bands 
can capture those even though you don't end up finding them and uh, putting retinopexy on them. Yeah. Uh, that can um, increase your chance of it working. Um, and that, that's pretty much the only time I tend to put it on. And I suppose I've gone for the situation of using them as a fellow for all pseudophagic rental attachments had an encircling band of vitrectomy and now actually I'm, I never use them. I never use them. And was that because the viewing systems were poorer? So maybe finding well, exactly. I think it, back in the day, the viewing systems, in comparison with what we have today, were rubbish. Quite frankly, it was you know you really didn't get a decent view of what was going on in the aura. And now you know we're so spoiled with the excellent views that we have. Hmm. And remember that if you're having a pseudophagic rectal attachment, <clears throat> the patient may be emetropic beforehand, but after a, a, an encircling band. They're going to be about minus two, minus three. Well, there's nothing wrong with being minus two, I minus two, but uh, you know they may not be happy. So there are refractive um, issues. Yeah. So we've got the results. Um, that's interesting. So about sixty percent of people use it uh, a couple of times a year, and a third never. Um, lovely. So encircling bands. I think really. I suppose if there's multiple round holes which are widespread throughout the retina and they've got a very large area of detached retina um, and a circling band perhaps has a role there and maybe supporting the vitreous base with anterior PVR. For, for me, if they're, if they're pseudophagic and can't find a break, I'll probably laser, use laser um, from dry to dry um, in a, uh, to try and capture anything that I can't see. Now, the you use a 240 band which is on the left here this is what we would use and then a silicon sleeve which is called a 270 sleeve and this is used so the, the band is two and a half millimeters can you see my mouse moving on there yes yeah, yeah so that's two and a half millimeters wide and 0.6 millimeters deep and the silicon sleeve is then used to wrap the uh, encircling band around each other you can use some watsky sleeve at spreading forceps and these are really nice because when you press on this bit this bit opens uh, so if, if you're using encirclement, uh, put the band about 12 to 14 millimeters from the limbus, pass it around the eye, pass the sleeve, the 270 sleeve of using that through it. You can then put some sutures in each quad and the sutures are not to create an indent, they're just to prevent, reduce the chance of that encircling band slipping backwards or forwards, tightening the buckle and then tying those sutures in place. I've got some pictures here from Paul Sullivan's book. So here's a 270 sleeve put on those Watsky forceps. And then as you press um, on this bit, this bit opens up so you can get access to the, to the lumen of the sleeve. And then you can pass the 240 band through the 270 sleeve, pass the other one the other way, and you end up with this configuration of a of a buckle or encircling band going through the sleeve, then you can tighten it, um, comme ça. So these are, that's the theory behind it. Now, how much do you shorten it? Now, I'm going to just give you a little bit of maths um, to remind you of school and of your youth. So that you remember what the circumference is? It's the, it's the distance around the edge of a circle and the radius is like that. And if you remember, the measurement of the circumference is 2 pi r, r being the radius, pi being pi and two being uh, double. Um, now if you want to have an, um, an indentation of one millimeter, the new circumference will be two pi r minus one. So this is irrelevant for what the size of the eye is, uh, what the size of therefore the radius is, this is the same for all eyes. The new circumference will be two pi r minus one. Now if you take that new circumference of two pi r minus one, and if you multiply out that bracket, bear with me, it's a little bit mathematical, you remember that 2 pi r minus 1 is the same as 2 pi r minus 2 pi. That is your new circumference, and you'll recognize that that is your old circumference. So this is irrelevant for what the size of the eye is. Those two figures are the same. So you want to reduce that by 2 pi, which is approximately, well, pi is 3.14 one, etc., etc. So two pi is about six millimeters. So therefore, if you want a one millimeter indent, you shorten the encircling band by six millimeters. You can ignore all that mass and just remember if you want one millimeter indent at six millimeters shortening, 
And if you want two millimeter indent, it's therefore 12 meter millimeter shorten. So this is a video of an encircling bat. So this is a, um, a pediatric retinal attachment with a patient with sticklers. As you can see, completely 360 dialysis. Uh, the vitrectomy was performed and uh, 360 endo laser. And then 5,000 centistoke gore was put in. And here's the 270 band on the, on the right coming, coming forth and being, being passed around all the muscles. You'll notice that some silicon oil is coming into the anterior segment. But this band is then passed around all the muscles. On the right there, you'll see the 270 sleeve. And then you pass that 240 band through that sleeve. And getting the other one through, it is fiddly and you've got to get the orientation right. You can, get, look, you can see a spaghetti junction there um, with all sorts of confusion. But eventually, you know, if you think hard and long enough, you can get that 240 band in the right orientation through the sleeve. Um, it's useful to have three hands like here. And then um, pull, pull that off, tighten, um, put the sutures in place in each quadrant. And then tighten the, the, um, the band and then tie everything off. So that's a pediatric case. And I think pediatric VR surgeons do have a, 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 um, a, do like using the circling bands in this kind of circumstance. This is a, a circumstance, this is a left eye of a young lady who's had a, a segmental buckle for round hole detachment temporary. So on the left of this screen, the retinal attachment failed. Um, no new breaks were visible. So the plan was to put an encircling band around it to tighten that indent and drain the, the subrenal fluid externally and then put some indirect laser on. But I won't show you all of that. Um, this, uh, you can see it's, it can be a bit of a, a, um, a mess opening the conjunctiva in an eye that's already been buckled. Um, slinging the muscles can be difficult in these eyes if there's a buckle already in place. Um, and using the groove of the existing 277 buckle can allow you to get the um, squint hook into that groove and then under the muscle so you can isolate the, the muscle and then put the, the 2 silk in there. And once again, you'll see here um, the squint hook being passed through the groove of the buckle. Now on the right here, you'll see a 240 band, which is then wrapped under the muscles and passed in through the groove. It fits nicely in the groove of the 277 buckle, which you can see there, round the pre-existing 277 buckle. And then again, you can see that that 240 band fits nicely in the groove of the 277 buckle. There's a sleeve there, the 270 sleeve. The 240 band is fed through that sleeve and then tightened. So you can use that if you want to um, make the indent of a, of a pre-existing segmental buckle higher for whatever reason. So uh, that was vitrectomy supplemented with, with, with bucklings. Now um, I'll briefly talk about chandelier buckles. So this was first described eight years ago um, using chandelier to help see internally. The pros of this, well, you're sitting down as opposed to all that standing up. You get a direct view, which we're much more accustomed to because we do a lot more vitrectomies. And it's therefore easier to train because you're more likely to see what the trainee surgeon is seeing. Uh, the cons to this really for me are uh, important is it's adding an internal aspect to cryobuckling which is actually an external procedure um, and I have some concerns about that but here's an example of chandelier guided buckle um, so this is a 29 gauge chandelier being used um, super nasally because the, the, the detachment was infratemporally you can see here that's looking from above so that's an infratemporal detachment and then you can indent with your cryoprobe from externally and you'll see the, the breaks light up. And you can see there's pallor in the retina there from the treated retinal holes. And then you can apply your, your buckle as you would normally and close off. Do many people, have, or do Steve or, or Richard have any experience of using a chandelier assisted buckling? Yeah, I've uh, I've used it once, and um, 
I, I found I didn't get the magnification that I wanted and the directionality of the chandelier wasn't ideal. I couldn't um, get the light where I needed it. So it's probably just my lack of experience of, of yeah. doing it like that and being used to using an indirect instead. Yeah. So I immediately went back to doing what I've always done in the past. Yeah, I don't have any experience of that, I suppose it's because I'm so used to doing the sort of the, the other technique really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, one does have concerns about it being an inter interocular procedure. Really. Yeah. I mean, those who advocate it say it is really fantastic and a game changer, but yeah. I feel that um, that internal process is a, it really adds an element that I don't think is necessary. And if you never use the indirect to buckle, then you're stumped if you don't have a microscope or an indirect chandelier. Sorry, a chandelier. Um, supercroidal buckling. So this is not a new thing. Supercroidal buckling is a, has been around for, I believe, a long, long time. Um, the principle of this is to dissect the sclera and get access to the supercroidal space and then use a cohesive viscoelastic to act as a temporary um, tamp uh, and buckle, an external tamponade. Um, to the retinal breaks and then apply retinopexy. Um, the pros are, well, it's cheap. Um, uh, there's no permanent buckle um, and it's temporary. And it, and it, it really has a, that's a really interesting and attractive um, advantage of it. The cons are, well, there's a learning curve, but there's a learning curve for everything. Um, and uh, there's a risk of coital hemorrhage. Um, and this can be a bit fiddly to get that cannula in the right place. Um, so here's, uh, I've got a, a camera, a photograph of this detachment. This is from the notes of a macular on retinal detachment um, <laughs> with some breaks superiorly and at six o'clock at the bottom. And it was a, decided to do a vitrectomy to supplement it with a inferior buckle. So here, as you can see, the, the, the retinal detachment, and that is six o'clock, that's the inferior break, um, which is then, um, uh, amputated, but that's right at six o'clock. And it, um, we then opened the conjunctiva. This is obviously slowed down um, immeasurably. Slung the inferior rectus. Um, this break has already been marked, as you can see, with endodiathermy, and then externally indentating, external indentation to help mark the location of the break externally. Then, uh, with a feather blade, opening the sclera to get access to the supercoidal space. Not a great view there to see those. Then we have a specialized supercoidal cannula, which is a cannula with an olive tip at the end uh, to uh, get access to the supercoidal space. And then you um, pass that cannula under the sclera above the choroid. And the Helon GV is used here, as you can see here, being injected in the supercoidal space, and you get a nice indent over the, um, over the inferior break in that circumstance. Um, in this case, there was another tear um, adjacent to that original tear or that inferior tear. And uh, through that same incision, um, Helon GV was, was applied to the second break adjacent. And there you can see the, the indent from the Helon GV. And then retinopexy was applied in this circumstance with laser. Um, and. Uh, the anterior part was treated with cryopexy. Um, this can be done just with a, an in, indirect and using a, a using it in a traditional buckle um, without the without the vitrectomy, but I've got no experience or videos of that. Um, so in summary, vitrectomy and buckle within encirclement I talked about. I think there are specific um, <laughs> circumstances this may be used. It's controversial and there's data um, supporting not doing it and doing it. Chandelier buckle I talked about which um, has advantages of you can sit down and get a direct view which we're more accustomed with and it perhaps has some advantages of teaching. A supercoidal buckling I think um, has a learning curve but the, the cohesive viscoelastic doesn't stay forever and there's no hardware left on the arm which I think is quite an attractive um, prospect. Um, thank you very much for listening and thank you um, to Dork for this and uh, Happy to we'll discuss any case, any questions? Or things yeah, I'm on. There's, there think, are some uh, questions. There are some questions on the the chat line. So um, one, the first one, someone's waiting very patiently for Mark. 
is what's the formula for shortening the band uh, for is this applicable for pediatric cases so the formula so, as, as i suggest so it's a it's it's irrelevant what the radius is because that maths formula it doesn't take into it doesn't matter what r is so yes and ask that question the shortening of the of the band is for all eyes of all all sizes yeah, so it's a really good tip to remember because it could it just applies to any kind All of right. six millimeter shortening is one millimeter inside. Um, okay, Mark, you've got lots of questions here. So there's another one from uh, Abdullah Laban. Hi, Abdullah. So hi, Mum. What is your preferred chandelier for assisted buckling? So I've I've done only a couple, and um, I've used 20, the twenty nine gauge chandelier, um, just one one port in the eye. I've not done many of them. Um, as, as a bit like um, Richard, I, 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 I have some anxieties of it, so I've not got a wealth of experience, but I've just used a 29 gauge chandelier for when I've used it. I've also used a 25 gauge port and just put a light pipe in, um, which has, you know, which is easy as well. But I think the smaller the better, because uh, you're leaving vitreous in the eye. You know, you may want to suture, suture that port. Yeah. Another question, again, to Amand, but I think actually we can all answer this a little bit. So from Francisco, is, in your opinion, a chandelier different compared to drainage? Both make it an in interocular procedure. So is drainage an interocular procedure? Richard, do you want to feel that? Yeah, well, it's, it's the fact that one is in the vitreous cavity and one is below the retina, isn't it? So drainage um, is uh, you're not interfering with the vitreoretinal interface. Whereas you are putting a chandelier in, because you're putting the chandelier into the vitreous cavity, where that where you could create forces between the vitreous and the retina. Whereas draining subretinal fluid is um, uh, not going to interfere with the vitreous and the vitreoretinal interface. Yeah, I think another thing to remember is that actually most of the time you're not going to be draining subretinal fluid with scleroblacting surgery it's not the default you're going to try and avoid it if it, you know so you're going to try and make sure that it is an extraocular procedure you know drainage does carry the risk of hemorrhage on some occasions so you want to try and avoid it as much as possible by sort of softening the eye with the good when you're when you're accessing the eye um prior to putting the buckle on indenting and indenting and indenting and that's going to soften the eye so you're going to get the deeper end in so you might not need to drain so there's First thing you do is try and avoid uh, draining. And I, and I find doing repeated uh, paracentesis, you know, so before you tighten the buckle, do a paracentesis and soften the eye. And then when you do your next suture, you might need to press on the back edge of the paracentesis again so you can soften the eye each time. And that's usually sufficient to put a you know, decent sized buckle on um, without um, occluding the central artery. I think. Um particularly macular off detachments. I think it, I'd be, I just have an extra element of caution if I'm gonna drain, I'd consider not draining even more so, because if there is a subretinal hemorrhage in a macular on detachment, it's probably not gonna be a problem. Mm. But if their macular is off, sure as sure can be, that blood will trackle down to the, into the fovea. Mm. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be particularly cautious about draining with, with, with a macular off detachment. I think from the point of view of trying to avoid hemorrhage with drainage, you want to be draining on a, on a firm eye. You don't want to be, or, or say, um, if you drain, then you need to be pressing on the eye. You don't want to drain and then think about putting your buckle on because then you're putting sutures on a very soft eye uh, and then you have a risk of, of hemorrhage. You want well, to I tend to put the buckle in place and put the sutures ready and in fact do the first throw so that that is all ready to go i've got nothing to do and then i drain press on the eye but then i can just grab the two ends and pull straight away and tighten the eye with the buckle mm. um, and yeah and i do something similar to that but i actually put one or two sutures on having done ac paracentesis and then only then when i've got a firm eye as as steve says i do my needle drain at that stage so that's um I'm not ever in a situation uh, where the eye is too soft to tamponade because obviously you need to be able to press on the eye to stop it bleeding. Should we go back to questions? So Crystal is asking, I always place an encircling band together with a buckle to relieve traction of the vitreous. 
but you will mainly place a single buckle. What are indications for an encircling band in a buckle? I mean, an encircling band, I think clearly I haven't put one on for ages. And it's, it's quite damaging for the eye, really. You're, you're um, opening up all the conjunctiva. It's very painful. You're going to have some sort of refractive sequelae. I just don't think it's really required in these days, actually. So, um, so, so I haven't put on. So I was trained using encircling bands all the time, but I haven't used one for years and years. Any of the others got a comment on that question? Yeah, the, the, why would you why would you put a, an encircling band and a buckle? Was that the question? Um, yeah, well, to to relieve traction of the vitreous, basically. Yeah, well, that that's the theory behind it, and. I suppose if you were going to put a buckle and you wanted a permanent indent, um, and for example, if you've got sclera that's too thin to put sutures through, then putting an encircling band on can help with that because the good thing about an encircling band is you're not using the sutures to create the indent. Uh, the sutures are just to stop the band moving anteriorly and posteriorly. Uh, and you can generally put those in without having to apply too much force to the sclera. Um, that you, you create the indent by tightening the band. So, you know, that, that, and, and that will produce a permanent indentation for you. Uh, if you've got somebody that's, you know, got sclera that's too thin to put posterior sutures in. Yeah. But, you know, that's not very often. The, the treatment of retinal attachment is really about treating the breaks and the retinopexy takes a week to get hold. So you really only need an indent or a tamponade internally for one to two weeks really for, for everything to work. So in most buckling cases, I don't think you need a permanent indent, which is why the superchoidal you know, buckle is a, is a theoretically a good an option because it lasts for two, four to six weeks and then it's gone completely. Great. Um, six millimeters, there's a question about six millimeters indenting. Yeah, that's a really good question because when you pull those bands, they stretch and then you let go and they've come back to where you've started. So you can put a little mark with a felt tip or with a sterile marker where you've started. So then you can pull. And then when you let go, you can see if, actually, if it's actually moved. Do you have any other tips on, 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 on knowing when you've, when you've shortened by a millimeter or six millimeters? It's, well, remembering back, it's just, a, yeah, I, I never did anything. But what I, what I would say a little tip about encircling bands is when they twist, you don't know whether something is twisted or not but if you make a little sort of cut so that the um there's like a little arrow on each end of the band which corresponds so you cut down so so one one side of, of the band is slightly shorter than the other so there's a sort of an acute edge or an acute angle on the side and that acute angle corresponds uh on each end of the buckle then you know whether things are twisted or not because when you put the the buckles together, the, so the ends of the band together, the point should should meet if the, the buckle, if, if the band isn't twisted. But that's a little tip for that. Um, question from Jason, do you like to drain in the bed of the buckle? Richard, do you like to drain in the bed of the buckle? I, I don't drain in the bed of the buckle usually. I, um, I usually just go posterior to it. But I think, yeah, you know, I, I agree. Basically, the bed of the buckle is probably going to be where your brakes are. And, and when your brakes cryo. are is where you've done your cryo. And yeah, so you've yeah. got some edema, you've got some edema, the core, well, you know, um, it's, so you're more likely to get a hemorrhage if you go through there. So that is a place I would not go through. And I think uh, we've agreed that it might be better to do a drain when you've got your buckle on. And so you're doing it behind. So you want to be avoiding where you've done the cryo. And the flu is probably deeper posterior to that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, now, mindful time is going past, um, but actually, there's the vast majority of participants are carrying on with this. I suggest we just go on for another few minutes, if that's okay, but perhaps aim to wrap up by quarter past um, the hour. Um, what do you so, do with um, submacular heme? What do you do when you have a submacular heme? Well, I've only had one and it absorbed. I don't know what I would do. What would you do? Again, yeah, if, if it's very thin blood, I mean, another thing actually to avoid, like many of these complications, the best thing to do is how do you avoid that complication? 
And when you do a drain, and Richard may have said it, but I can't remember. When you do the, you do the drain, and then the first thing you do is you have pressure on the eye, so you know you've got a high pressure. And then you're looking at, you get, you've got your indirect on, and you look at the back of the eye, and then you try and find your drain site, and then you just see what it looks like. And you should see a little white spot, or well, as, the, as fluid drains away, you'll see all the sort of fluid go out through this little spot. And you're putting pressure on it, which is said three minutes. It's hard to wait three minutes, it's a long time. But so you get three minutes, then just, you're observing your drain site and then just let the pressure off. And then if you're going to get a drain site hemorrhage, you'll see a little bead of blood appear at the drain site. So you're observing, you know, within the eye. And then you'll do is put the pressure on again. What, what you don't want to do is drain and then walk away from the eye and then wonder what's happening. Go back five minutes later and you've got a submacular hemorrhage. You want to be observing. Having said that, if you do get submacular hemorrhage, then if it's very thin, you could just leave it. Um, you can really go in and try and get rid of the blood. I think I would probably not do it there and then. Um, clearly pe people, some people go in and do a vitrectomy and then try and get rid of the blood. Um, I mean, you could always, I suppose you, I don't know, I've never done, I've, I've never had the situation where I've had to, to be honest. Okay, uh, any other questions? Because subcoidal buckle you have performed, how long did it last for? It lasted for maybe about six weeks. Um, it got smaller and smaller over about four to six weeks. Um, and you can still see in the clinic afterwards. Um, can I ask Aman a question? You, you did that in the context of a vitrectomy, so that was like yeah. a vitrectomy. Have you done them just de novo instead of doing a vitrectomy? Just no, I haven't. Um, I, I, think, I think it would be quite, quite, quite a challenge to view, but yeah, it's possible, you know, because you'd need to indent mark exactly where the broken is, that's fine. But then injecting while looking with an indirect, mm. um, you'd need, you know, you need, um, yeah, it is possible, and I know people would do it. But I just think it's you, you, it's quite, you know it's a little bit anxiety driven anyway. You know when you're injecting at the supercortical space with all that vascular tissue there, doing it at arm's length while observing it um, with an indirect and and, uh, and a twenty D must be quite a fiddle. I suppose you could do it with a chandelier and make that an internal, mm -hmm. you know, do the chan, you know chandelier assisted buckle, and then you'll it's much the same as doing it with a vitrectomy. Good. So I think what we might do is just have this one more question. And for those leaving, just do please fill in the post-event evaluation form as when you leave. So there's something about from David. Uh, do you cut encircling bands after a few months to prevent ocular ischemia? When I think you have ocular ischemia, then that's a pretty acute event, mm. by my memory. Um, and but, you're putting the buckle on because you want a long-standing indent. Yeah, exactly. So I think the answer is no really to that mm. so i think we'll wrap it up there so thanks everyone for your attendance i think there's still 66 participants out of 72 or something so that's pretty good going for this i did have some cases to show but i think we said it's an hour long webinar so and uh, i think many of us perhaps have been on zoom sessions <laughs> a lot of the day so i think we'll call it a day there um do develop your skills for buckling surgery and that means for the trainees that aren't doing any surgery practice your indirect ophthalmoscopy it's really really important and uh, you know lie the patients down prep practice little indentation and all the time hopefully is you're doing you're getting tips from richard and aman and you're putting little things in your call it the surgical suitcase as you as you go through your surgical education you, you think have things think i like that and you put it in a surgical suitcase richard wants to say something richard. Um, yeah i recommend getting some model eyes because you can those videos that i showed you i recorded those on my kitchen table so you can practice all of this at, uh, at home at your leisure um and uh and and then when you come to actually do the procedures, you've got your hands in the right place and you've got the process in your mind that you're going to go through. It really, really helps uh, going through all those steps beforehand uh, on the kitchen table uh, for when you have to do it for real. Could you tell them where you got yours from? Well, you can get them. There's, there's, a, there's a website called Simulated Ocular Surgery 
and uh, so if you just put simulated ocular surgery into Google, that will take you to the website and you can, you can purchase them from there. There's actually a, they're manufactured by a company called Philips Studios that are based in Bristol. And, um, and, but you can buy the heads and you can buy the eyes and, and you can um, steal some buckles from, from your hospital and, and, and practice putting them on. Yeah, so I thoroughly recommend those. And that's what we use um, on the Beavers Buckling course which unfortunately won't be held this year, but anyway, so recommend those. Um, I think we should acknowledge Paul Sullivan um, yes. did lots of work on this, on this sort of buckling course quite a few years ago, and there's lots of his uh, schematics that we've used, so thanks to Paul. Thanks to Dork for arranging this. Thanks to all the participants. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, thanks to Richard Amand for helping me out um, and uh, giving fantastic talks. And enjoy your buckling surgery, enjoy retinal attachment surgery. Good luck in your vitretinal careers and stay safe in these strange times and please fill in the feedback. Thanks very much. Thank you guys, thank you Doc. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.